This is the third and final video which forms part of the PM120 and PM130 calculation syllabus and in this presentation we'll be covering dilutions and pH. As with the previous videos, you should watch this video prior to attending your tutor session where you will have the opportunity to go through the homework questions that form part of this presentation and to ask questions about any aspect of this presentation that you have found confusing with your tutor. So the first part of this presentation we're going to be looking at dilutions and why we need them. Dilutions are pretty essential because solutions are very often diluted to achieve the required molarity that you need. So it's very rare that you will actually have solutions at the exact molarity that you want for experiments. So therefore the ability to dilute accurately and quickly is an essential skill that you must develop. There are two types of dilutions that you will encounter. A simple dilution or a serial dilution. And the difference really is that a simple dilution is just a one-step dilution, whereas a serial dilution will be multi-steps. In this example of a simple dilution, a one-step dilution, 100 millilitres of one molar sodium chloride is diluted to a final volume of one litre. So what is the molarity of the new solution? Well, the first thing we need to do is to calculate what the dilution factor is. And the way you do this is to take the volume that you end up with, which is a thousand millilitres or one litre, and you divide it by the volume that you start with, in this case, a hundred millilitres. And this gives us our dilution factor, which is 10. So therefore, the concentration of sodium chloride has also been reduced by a factor of 10, and is now 0.1 molar. This can be written as a 1 in 10 dilution. A concept that a lot of students struggle with is this in or to. A 1 in 10 dilution is the same as 1 to 9, and we can represent this visually. Imagine you have a beaker, and in that beaker you have 9 red balls. To that beaker you add 1 green ball. So the number of green balls in the beaker is 1, the number of red balls is 9. So therefore there is one green ball in a total of 10 balls, but I've added one green ball to 9 red balls. So 1 in 10, or 1 to 9, is the same dilution factor. An equation that many of you will have come across before is this one. C1V1 equals C2V2. And this is useful if you have a known concentration and volume of a solution and you need to dilute it to give you a new concentration. Using our sodium chloride for the previous example, C1 is equal to 1 molar, so this is the original concentration of the solution, and V1 was equal to 100 millilitres. V2, so this, the volume that we end up with, was 1000 millilitres. So rearranging our equation C1V1 equals C2V2, we come up with C1V1 divided by V2 gives us the new concentration. So C1 is equal to 1 times 100 divided by 1000, which gives us a final concentration of 0.1 molar. This second example follows the same principle, but is slightly more complicated because the volumes involved are not equivalent. 50 microliters of a 1 millimolar glucose solution is added to Benedict's solution to give a final volume of 2 millilitres. What is the concentration of glucose in this final mixture? The first step that we have to do is to convert one of the volumes to an equivalent. So for this example I've chosen to convert 50 microliters to 0 0.05 millilitres. So I've done that simply by dividing by 1000. Our concentration is 1 millimolar multiplied by the original volume, which is 0 0.05 millilitres, is equal to the new concentration multiplied by the new volume, which is 2 millilitres. Dividing both sides by 2 will give us our concentration of the new solution. So C2 is equal to 0 0.025 millimolar, which is the equivalent of 25 micromolar, which you get by multiplying by 1000. An alternative way of doing this would be to work out what the dilution factor is. So the dilution factor is equal to 2 divided by 0 0.05. So that is the volume that you end up with, 2 millilitres, 
divided by the volume that you started with, which is 50 microliters or 0 0.05 milliliters. So that gives us a dilution factor of 40. Dividing 1, which is the original concentration for 1 millimolar, by 40 gives us the same values, so 0 0.025 millimolar or 25 micromolar. A nice way for you to remember dilution factors is that the dilution factor is what I need or what I end up with divided by what I have or what I start with. Serial dilutions are similar to simple dilutions but in this case we'll have a sequence of dilutions that amplifies the dilution effect. Serial dilutions are summative not additive so it's important to remember this when you're carrying out serial dilutions. In this example we start with a one molar stock solution. That is diluted 1 in 10 or 1 to 9. The new concentration of that solution will be 1 tenth of the original concentration, so it will be 0 0.1 molar. If we then take the, that second solution, which is 0 0.1 molar, and dilute that 1 in 10, the new concentration will be 0 0.01 molar. Essentially, we have a first step, which is 1 in 10, and we have a second step, which is 1 in 10. So the overall dilution from the original stock solution to what we end up with is 10 times 10, which is a 1 in 100 dilution. So the original solution is 1 100th of the concentration of the original stock. At this point, some of you may be asking why you need to do serial dilutions and why you can't just do a simple dilution each time. Using this example, what would happen if I needed a 0.1 millimolar solution of sodium hydroxide? How many grams would I need to weigh out if I wanted to make one litre of that solution? Well, the molecular weight of sodium hydroxide is 40 grams per mole. Therefore, in order to get a 0 0.0001 molar solution, I need to multiply that by the molecular weight, which is 40, which would tell me that I need 0 0.004 grams in one litre. The big problem we have here is can you measure 0 0.004 grams accurately? And unless you have an incredibly accurate balance, you're probably not going to be able to do that. So what's the solution? Well, one way is to make a more concentrated stock solution and then dilute that down further in order to achieve your target concentration. One potential approach to this problem is to work out how many times I would need to dilute my one molar stock solution in order to achieve my 0 0.01 millimolar stock. The way you can do this is the same as with dilution factors. We start with a one molar solution, i.e. what I already have, and we divide it by what we need. So in this case, 0 0.0001 molar. And this tells us that there's a 10,000 fold difference in concentration. Now doing a 10,000 fold dilution in one step would not be very easy. But remember, serial dilutions are summative. So if I start off with a 1 in 100 dilution, which is fairly easy to do, I would get a 0 0.01 molar stock solution. So that's 1 molar divided by 100, giving me 0 0.01 molar. Taking that new stock solution of 0 0.01 molar and doing a further 1 in 100 dilution will give me the 0 0.01 millimolar stock solution that I need. So the two 1 in 100 dilutions are summative and result in a 10,000 fold dilution that I need to achieve. As with most things, there are benefits and drawbacks to serial dilutions. One of the main benefits is that you only have to make one stock solution and then you can dilute to your required concentrations from that original stock solution, as you would, for example, when creating a standard curve. A second benefit is that it minimizes the amounts of potentially expensive reagents that are used. You would only need to make a small amount of your top stock solution because then that is going to be diluted in order to give you the concentrations that you actually need. The drawbacks are that every time you do a dilution, there are sources of error. And those errors become compounded. So the more dilutions you have, the more potential sources of error you're introducing into your experiments. 
In this example, we're going to put several of the concepts that we've covered in this presentation and in the previous presentations together. The molar absorption coefficient of a denazine is 8372 litres per mole per centimetre at 254 nanometers. A 2 milliliter sample of that adenosine solution is taken from a volume of 10 mils and added to 4 mils of water. The absorbance at 254 nanometers is measured and gives 0.523 absorbance units. The question is how many nanomoles did the original 10 mil solution contain and what volume of that solution would contain one micromole of adenosine? In order to approach this question, we're going to combine knowledge of Beer-Lambert's law with dilution factors. If you remember from the second video in this series, Beer-Lambert's law states that the absorbance is equal to the molar absorption coefficient multiplied by the concentration multiplied by the path length. And that equation can be rearranged to C equals A divided by epsilon L. Plugging in the values that we have from the previous slide, the concentration could be worked out as 0.523, which was the absorbance, divided by 8372, which is a molar absorption coefficient, multiplied by 1, which is the path length of the cuvette. And this gives us a value of 62.4 times 10 to the minus 6 molar, which is an equivalent of 62.47 micromolar. Now that is the absorbance of the diluted sample. So the first thing that we need to do is to factor in the dilution factor. We end up with 6 mils of solution. If you remember, we took 2 mils of the adenosine solution and we mixed it with 4 mils of water, giving us a final volume of 6. The volume that we added was 2. So the dilution factor is 6 divided by 2, which gives us a dilution factor of 3. So therefore, 62.47 multiplied by 3 gives us a concentration in the original sample of 187.41 micromolar. Now this is the concentration of the original solution, but this is only part of the answer. In order to complete this calculation, we're going to need to apply our knowledge of unit conversions and reciprocals. 187.41 micromolar means that there is 187.41 micromoles per litre. The question asked us to calculate how many nanomoles there were within the 10 mil sample. So to do this, I'm going to convert this concentration to nanomoles per microliter. And I do that by reducing both sides by a factor of 1000. So 187.41 micromoles per litre is the equivalent of 187.41 nanomoles per milliliter. Because I know that I have 10 mils of the original sample, I therefore multiply the concentration by the volume, and this tells me that I had 1,874.1 nanomoles per 10 mils of my original adenosine solution. The last part of the question was what volume would contain a micromole of adenosine. Now to do this, I'm going to convert my units again. So I'm going to have 187.41 divided by 1000, and that's going to give me 0 0.18741 micromoles per milliliter. So I've taken my original concentration, and all I've done is worked out how many micromoles are present in one milliliter. To work out how many micromoles I would have, I would take one micromole divided by the concentration, and that tells me that 5.34 milliliters would contain one micromole of adenosine. Switching to the second part of this presentation, where we're going to look a little bit at pH, pKa, and buffers. Now, a lot of the underlying theory is going to be covered by Dr. Jones in PM133, so I don't intend to go into the background theory here. But what we are going to go through is some of the types of calculations that you may be expected to answer both as part of the 133 exam, but also as part of the PM120-130 calculations test. Just to briefly recap what acids and bases are. Acids are able to produce hydrogen ions by dissociation. 
So if you were to bubble hydrogen chloride gas through water, you would end up with a hydrazium ion, which is H3O+, and a chloride ion, which is Cl- in an aqueous solution. Bases, on the other hand, are able to extract a proton, H+. So if you were to dissolve potassium hydroxide in water, you would end up with a potassium ion, and you would end up with a hydroxide ion, so K+, and OH-. Strong acids and bases are able to completely dissociate, whereas weak acids and bases exist in an equilibrium. And it's this weak acids and base in equilibrium theory that we can exploit in our buffers. The pH acts as a measure of acidity, and the pH is simply the negative log of the molar concentration of the hydroxide ions. As an example, what is the pH of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid? Using our equation above, we can define that 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid has a concentration of H plus ions of 0.1 molar. Therefore, the pH is equal to the negative log of 0.1, which is negative negative 1, which gives us a pH value of plus 1. Buffer systems are able to resist small changes in pH and they are a mix of a conjugate acid base pair. In the example here, you can see that the H2CO3 on the left hand side is a conjugate acid, and because it gives up a hydrogen ion, it becomes a conjugate base on the right hand side of the equation. Now because this equation acts in equilibrium, if you were to add hydrogen ions to the right hand side, it would push the equilibrium to the left, causing more H2CO3 to form, which is HA. If you add an alkaline to the right hand side, it will cause more HA to dissociate, therefore pushing the equilibrium to the right. And although the pH does not stay completely stable, the change is much smaller than if you did not have this buffer system present. The pH of a buffer system can be calculated using the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, and this is probably one of the most useful equations involving pH. The Henderson-Hasselbach equation states that the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of A- divided by the concentration of HA. Or more generally, you can write this as the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of the proton acceptor divided by the concentration of the proton donator. And the pKa is a value that is dependent on the chemical structures involved and the surrounding environment, for example, the temperature. An example of the type of calculation that you might encounter involving the Henderson-Hasselbach equation is something similar to this. The pKa of acetic acid is 4.75 at 25 degrees C. What is the pH of a solution containing 0.2 molar acetic acid and 0.5 molar acetate ions? Stating the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of A-, which in this case is the acetate ion, which has a concentration of 0.5, divided by the concentration of HA, which in this case is the acetic acid, which has a concentration of 0.2. Working this out, we come up with a value that the pH is equal to 4.75 plus the log of 2.5. So the pH is equal to 4.75 plus 0.398. So the pH of acetic acid in this situation is 5.148. pKa can also be used to calculate the isoelectric points of amino acids. So an amino acid with an uncharged side chain will have two pKa values, one for the amino group and one for the carbonyl group. The chemical structures here show glycine, and at low pH, which is the first structure, you will notice that the amino group has been protonated, so is NH3+. The carbonyl group has also been protonated, so is COOH. So at low pH, the net charge of glycine is plus 1. As you move towards a neutral pH, you get what's called a Zwitter ion. And in a Zwitter ion, there's a net overall charge of 0 because the amino group has been protonated and the carbonyl group has been deprotonated, so there's a plus one and a negative one charge, so the net charge is zero. As you move to high pH, 
the amino group becomes deprotonated and becomes NH2. And the carbonyl group is also deprotonated, so is COO minus. So at high pHs, the overall charge is minus one. For amino acids that have only got these two pKa's, the pH at which the amino acid has no net charge can be calculated simply by taking the mean of the pKa values. So for glycine, the amino group has got a pKa of 9.60 and the carbonyl group has got a pKa of 2.34. The average of those is 5.97. So when the pH surrounding the amino acid, glycine, is at 5.97, there will be a net overall charge of zero, and that is the isoelectric point, or PI, of glycine. If an amino acid has an ionizable side chain, then the situation becomes a little bit more complex. Using arginine as an example, the three pKa values for arginine are 2.17 for the carbonyl group, 9.04 for the amino group, and 12.48 for the side chain, which we'll refer to as the R group. We need to consider the net charge on the molecule in order to determine the isoelectric point, i.e. where arginine has no net overall charge. So how would you go about calculating the PI of arginine? Well, to do this, you need to consider the net overall charge of arginine at different pHs. And if you start at a very low pH, then if put the net overall charge is plus 2, because all of the ionizable groups will have been protonated. The amino group will become NH3+, the R group is RH+, and the carbonyl group is COOH. As you increase the pH past the first pKa value, then the carbonyl group will give up its hydrogen and become COO-, so therefore the net overall charge drops by 1 to plus 1. Raising the pH still further past the pKa value for the NH3 group and you will end up with a net overall charge of zero. The amino group has given up its hydrogen, so it's NH2. The carbonyl group remains COOH and the R group remains RH+. So therefore you have a net charge of zero. Increasing the pH further past the last pKa value for the R group side chain and you will have a net overall charge of minus 1. All of the groups have given up their hydrogen, so it's NH2, R and COO-. In order to calculate the PI, you need to use the two pKa values that flank the zero neutral charge. So in this case, the PI is equal to 9.04 plus 12.28 divided by 2, which will give you a PI of 10.76 for arginine. As with the previous presentations, there are now a series of homework questions for you to attempt prior to attending your tutorial. You can, of course, pause the movie in order to get the information off the slides. Please do try these questions before coming to the tutorial sessions so that you are able to ask your tutor specific questions about the gaps in your knowledge. The first question is about concentrations and we have given you some information in a table which you will need to complete. The second question is about dilutions and using appropriate prefixes in order to give your answers. The third question is a more complicated dilution series in which you'll need to work out how many colony forming units were present in a bacterial stock solution. The third question is about pH and pKa, so using Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And then the final question is about the isoelectric point of amino acids that we've just covered in the last few slides. Thank you for listening.